Dr. Spinaki has been practicing in clinical epilepsy since 2000 with an emphasis on women's issues in epilepsy, diagnosis and treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy and interpretation of continuous EEG studies. She also offers pre-surgical evaluation of patients who are candidates for epilepsy surgery and other invasive techniques such as vagus nerve stimulation and responsive neurostimulation. Prior to joining Albany Med, Dr. Spinaki served as medical director of the Henry Ford Comprehensive Epilepsy Center and director of the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, where she was also a senior staff neurologist. She has also held academic appointments in neurology at Wayne State University in Detroit and at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Today, she will be giving us an update on treatments for epilepsy. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Spinaki. Oh, I think we have to unmute. There we go. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to be part of the family of the Epilepsy Foundation Northeastern uh, New York. I have uh, to say that, uh, as Erica pointed out, I have uh, worked in uh, two other states, and I have to say that uh, this Epilepsy Foundation of Northeastern New York has been very active, has been a great partner for epilepsy patients, for their families, and for physicians who practice in the area. And uh, I cannot uh, um, emphasize more the value they add to our patients' care. I would also like to thank the sponsors because without their support, these events cannot happen. Uh, the sponsors provide us with um, medications with devices that can be used in our clinical practice to fight epilepsy and make patients uh, seizure free because this is after all our goal. So uh, I would like to thank them and also uh, speak to the point that they are par partners in disseminating the uh, education uh, for epilepsy. They can help us reach out to all the communities that we serve, uh, both uh, families, patients, and physicians. So now I will uh, start my presentation and uh, I will try to give you an overview of the epilepsy treatments and what has been happening in the past year or uh, for so many years that we are trying to develop new ways of uh, treating epilepsy. Next slide, please. Janine already mentioned how frequent epilepsy is uh, being diagnosed and how many epilepsy patients we have in the communities we serve in Northeastern New York. Overall, we have 3 million active epilepsy patients, which means they are on the seizure medication or they have been on anti seizure medication for the past five years. That's the definition of active epilepsy. Obviously, this number includes those who have been diagnosed with epilepsy because I strongly believe that there are many more who do have active epilepsy, but they were not diagnosed. And that brings me to the next point on this slide, the prevalence in older than 65, 1.5%. And this is the segment of population that I'm very much concerned about because those individuals who are older than 65 and very young and very productive and very healthy, they may have seizures that we we, cannot, we do not diagnose because we do not suspect. Everyone who has a weakness or facial droop, they, we activate the stroke alert and uh, we make a diagnosis or rule out the diagnosis. See, however, if a patient has a, a motor activity of one arm, it's undetected and no one thinks that this might be epilepsy rather than a stroke. Prevalence is uh, meaning uh, how many 
patients with epilepsy, we have in 1,000 population and we have four to eight individuals with epilepsy. So pretty high prevalence. And again, these are individuals who are diagnosed with epilepsy. Next slide, please. This is an old slide that uh, shows uh, very well the point that I raised. Increase in epilepsy cases after the age of 60. And uh, this is very important because physicians and families are very responsible in making the diagnosis in a timely fashion. We have 200,000 new cases of epilepsy diagnosed annually. Next one. This is an old slide, and this is the old classification of epilepsy. Despite the fact that it's old, it's still used. We had a revision of the epilepsy seizure type. And nowadays, the complex partial seizures are no longer complex partial seizures. They are called focal impaired awareness seizures. The generalized seizures are, call, are called tonic-clonic seizures or focal to tonic-clonic convulsion seizures. The simple partial seizures are called, are defined as focal aware seizures. Other partial seizures that depends if they are sensory seizures versus focal seizures. So the seizure type uh, classification has changed. However, the frequencies haven't changed. And the great majority of seizures are those that are not generalized. Other partial, simple partial, or complex partial, as we call them a few years back, which means that these might be more difficult to diagnose. Next, please. I will focus on endepileptic medication, neurostimulation, and minimally invasive techniques. I will not speak as much about the surgical management because our time is somewhat limited. However, surgical management of epilepsy plays a major role in appropriate cases Patient can be, patients can become seizure-free. Next one. This is uh, a slide that I always use in my presentations because it, it has a very good visual uh, how we advanced our treatment options in epilepsy. And you can clearly see that for a number of years, uh, before 1970, we had the second generation drugs and that was about it. So we had to wait for more than 10 years from 1970 to 1990 to start developing new generation and a seizure medication. So I have seen in the 20 plus years that I have been practicing, I have seen this growth in medication. Is there room to grow further? Of course it is. And uh, I'm hoping that in the pipeline, we have the fourth generation medication that is gonna be available to our patients and their families to manage epilepsy. Next one, please. This is a very important slide, and I always show this slide to people, to individuals, the providers who are involved in the care of epilepsy patients or neurology providers and primary care physicians. It's very important not to memorize which medication is broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. To me, it, the most important fact that we need to take home is that we have medications that are broad spectrum and work for any type of seizure slash epilepsies. And we have the narrow spectrum drugs that work for some particular types of epilepsies and not all of them. Therefore, if we have any doubt as to what epilepsy we are managing, primary generalized epilepsy or genetic epilepsies as we call them versus focal onset epilepsies that generalize, 
we need to use broad spectrum drugs because if, for instance, we use oxcarbamazepine for an epilepsy that is primarily generalized or genetic epilepsy, we can make seizures worse. It's not that oxcarbamazepine is not working, it's that it's not the appropriate medication for the type of epilepsy that we are treating. And believe me, the diagnosis of epilepsy, primary generalized versus focal onset epilepsy, is not made easily at all times. So we need to stick to broad spectrum medication if we have doubts about the classification of epilepsy. Next one, please. I will uh, move to the medications that have been approved most recently, and most recently means uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And I will uh, start with lacosamide, Vimpat. It was approved in 2008 as add-on uh, therapy and many years later as monotherapy. Each medication is initially add-on gets add-on approval and then we move to monotherapy. Uh, however, I have to say that physicians uh, can take the liberty to use medication as monotherapy even if it hasn't been FDA approved. It works through sodium channels and uh, it's considered to be a broad spectrum and seizure medication. Side effects, I will focus on prolongation of PR interval. It doesn't happen very frequently and we don't run EKGs on a routine basis before we prescribe the medication, but it's always good to ask patients if they ever had any arrhythmia or any cardiological issue. It may affect memory or mood, but not as much as we think it does or it has been reported as side effects. We start low 50 milligrams twice a day. You can go up to 600 milligrams. Uh, however, uh, I have to say that sometimes the health plans do not approve the 600 milligrams because FDA approved it up to 400. So we may have some challenges there. What is also very important with this medication, it's provided IV, which means that you can use it for acute management of seizures. Next one, please. Rufinamide is uh, another medication that was uh, relatively recently approved, like 12, 13 years now. And this is the medication that goes by name uh, Banzel. It was approved for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And it, again, it works through sodium channels. We can give high doses and we can titrate every seven to 14 days. And we can give really high doses up to 3,200 milligrams that we divide uh, in a BID schedule twice a day. Dizziness, ataxia, and again, if there are some arrhythmias uh, or short Q10, QT, we shouldn't prescribe this. It's a medication that is used heavily in pediatric population with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. It has some place, obviously, in adult population, but the indication was for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. The next one, please. Clobazam uh, is a benzodiazepine that has a long half-life. It has been around since the 70s, and the first studies were done in Europe and Canada. However, it took a number of years to be approved by FDA here in the US. So we have been available, uh, it has been available and we have been uh, at our disposal, this medication since 2011. We use it as a broad spectrum and decision medication add on. It's not first line medication. We cannot use just as monotherapy, although rarely it can be used as monotherapy. Again, Lennox Gastaut syndrome was the indication that uh, was um, approved by FDA. It has, a, as a benzodiazepine, it binds to GABA receptors. And I want to remind everybody that GABA is the good neurotransmitter for epilepsy. It disinhibits seizure frequency. 
uh, some rush uh, uh, side effects can uh, can happen. Uh, I haven't seen it as much, uh, so I don't think it's, it's a major concern that we always start low and do it from five milligrams uh, going upwards and we go up to 40 milligrams that is given in two divided doses. Next one. Uh, Verapamel, oh, I, I, um, uh, I uh, uh, would like to apologize. This is uh, the, the brand name is uh, Ficomba and this Verapamel. So I apologize for V instead of uh, uh, P. It's a new class of medication and that's uh, very, very important. So we are moving away for sodium channels. Uh, we are moving away from GABAergic um, act, uh, mechanism of action, and you are moving to a, a completely different uh, pathways for treating epilepsy. And this is AMPA type uh, uh, glutamate receptor antagonist. So by antagonizing AMPA, we think that we can have a better control of seizures. It was approved eight years ago for uh, refractory partial onset seizures in uh, children to, uh, 12, in, I'm sorry, in patients 12 years or older. It can be given once a day because perampanel has long half-life and we start with four milligrams at night and we titrate slowly up to 12 milligrams. It is a powerful medication and it has been shown that it can control tonic-clonic seizures. We are uh, aware of neuropsychiatric side effects. Therefore, we need to monitor closely these individuals. And obviously, if there is a background of uh, ag aggression and agitation and any other psychiatric conditions, we need to be very careful. Central nervous side effects can happen with this medication, like everything else, like dizziness, uh, fatigue, and as I mentioned, impact on mood. The next one uh, is uh, uh, an overview of a medication uh, that is uh, called acyl carbamazepine. You can uh, tell uh, by looking at the name that it is a, a close relative of carbamazepine. Uh, however, there are some pluses in using this medication. Because of long half-life, it can be used once, which increases compliance and helps individuals who have to combine this medication with other drugs so they don't have frequent dosing. It was approved relatively recently, seven to eight years, ago as a dawn therapy and uh, it, the, in comparison to carbamazepine it doesn't have active, active metabolites so it doesn't have strong interaction with other drugs and it, it does not really affect uh, the liver enzymes as much and that goes back to it lacks significant interactions with other drugs and we don't have the, the, the high risk of hyponatremia that we have with oxcarbamazepine or trileptal and can be given once a day up to 1200 milligrams. Next, please. Uh, we have a medication that uh, has been recently approved uh, for a very uh, young, individuals, kids, uh, younger than one month. So uh, you can give, in reality, you can give Rivaracetam or Breviact uh, to any age group patients. Uh, initially it was approved in 2016. It, it is very uh, helpful for acute management of seizures because it's, obvious, it's not only oral, but uh, we use it IV. And that's so important to remember because when we have to manage seizures in an acute setting of the emergency room, we need a number of different drugs to utilize. Uh, it, it has um, a novel uh, mechanism of action like levetiracetam, and also it uh, uh, has a mechanism through sodium channel uh, mechanism or it has a sodium channel blocking uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, it's uh, well tolerated 
And uh, it has been shown in studies that it may not cause uh, mood uh, behavioral changes. Uh, so it is IV, yeah, acute management, another one at our disposal to use in very young individuals with epilepsy and also in the acute setting. Next one, please. Uh, that was um, a turning point in treating epilepsy. Uh, and this is uh, the use of cannabis uh, that uh, was approved uh, as Epidiolex. And it was the first plant uh, um, uh, derived uh, cannabinoid. And it was approved very, very recently in 2018 for Lennox Gaston Dravet syndrome, the catastrophic epileptic encephalopathies. We can titrate up to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. There might be some GI side effects, some decreased appetite and weight loss, sleepiness, and we need to monitor from time to time liver enzymes to make certain that we don't have um, elevated liver enzymes. Next one. A very, uh, one of the newest medications, very new, uh, almost brand new, I would say, since it was approved in 2019 for partial onset epilepsy, is refractory to, to treatment. Uh, it's considered to be a medication for partial, partial onset epilepsy. However, in animal models, it has shown broad spectrum action. And this is very important because remember, we need many broad spectrum and decision medication to fight epilepsy that we don't know, we cannot classify as generalized versus focal onset. Mechanism is uh, uh, through sodium channels. Uh, it is, um, it can cause some central, uh, central nervous side effects. This is uh, this happens with every medication like uh, fatigue, somnolence, dizziness, and dress syndrome, which is a hypersensitivity uh, syndrome. And that's why uh, it was um, reported during the initial trial. And after that, we decided to start low and go slow. And uh, I need to remind everybody how we have been doing um, uh, the titration with lamotrigine uh, medication that had high risk of rash when we went very fast in our titration. But right now we know that slow titration can eliminate some side effects. It has been uh, uh, reported that it can lower significantly up to 50% the, uh, uh, the, the, the frequency of generalized seizures, which is very important uh, since those are considered to be the most significant seizures to deal with. And the next one uh, shows us that there is ongoing progress in developing new medication. It was approved in 2020 for Dravet syndrome for kids younger than, uh, older than two years of age. Uh, however, uh, because of uh, some uh, side effects that we need to be aware of, like uh, uh, valvular heart disease and pulmonary arterial hypertension, it has a restricted drug distribution uh, through uh, particular pharmacies. And there is gonna be also um, a risk evaluation and medication program. So uh, that means uh, the physician needs to inform the family about the, the, the potential side effects uh, certain pharmacies will dispense the medication and there's going to be a risk evaluation uh, throughout the course of treatment. And uh, a part of this uh, controlled supervision or controlled uh, prescription uh, uh, pattern is going to be echocardiogram uh, before we start the therapy and every six months. And also when we complete the, firm, the therapy will terminate or discontinue the medication. Six months later, we need to have another echocardiogram. Uh, uh, the next one, please. Another turning point, how we dispense medication. 
to me, it's very, very important as a physician. It's also important for patients and families to have many ways of taking the medicine, not only orally, not all IV, but also intranasal administration, in my opinion, is a very, very significant improvement in dispensing those medications. So we have intranasal diazepam approved in 2020. The initial uh, dose is five milligrams and 10 milligram doses are also available. Uh, and uh, we, uh, there are very uh, detailed instructions as to how to utilize the medication. Uh, the first dose uh, is given, and if it's not effective, the second dose may be given uh, four hours after the initial dose. Uh, it's um, very, very important that we are moving into different uh, ways of uh, giving uh, uh, medication for acute management of seizures at home. That's the important thing. Uh, our goal is of course, make people seizure free, but if this is not achieved, we do not want people to come to the hospital. We don't want them to be seen in the emergency room. Next one, please. Intranasal midazolam. Midazolam has been given IV for a number of years, but you didn't have intranasal uh, solution. And it's so important that it was approved by FDA. It was developed and approved in 2019. We typically give five milligrams into one nostril, and then we uh, one additional dose into the opposite nostril can be given in 10 minutes if we do not have cessation of seizure activity. Uh, we uh, uh, typically use two doses, maximum 10 milligrams. Uh, it's um, also uh, uh, very, very important uh, to uh, be given at home so patients don't come uh, in the emergency room. And I would say that it's very important as part of our prescription habits in cases uh, who have intractable seizures to uh, use, uh, to uh, prescribe those so they are available to family members when seizures happen at home. Next one, please. Intranasal um, uh, diazepam. Uh, again, it was approved in 2020. I think that I mentioned it already, so we can move to the next one, please. Uh, this is a very important concept, what drug-resistant epilepsy means. I am afraid that um, not everybody recognizes what drug-resistant epilepsy is, so we may not be successful in proceeding uh, with different options than medical, uh, 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 um, uh, that medication, than drugs. So we need to all register that if we have failed two or three major drugs, uh, the, the control of seizures is very unlikely. So uh, uh, despite the development of different drugs, still we have 30% of individuals with epilepsy who develop drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, however, that's not something that we need to be um, disappointed about because that gives us the opportunity to develop a new medication, new devices, and new, new approaches in treating epilepsy. Next one, please. Uh, again, uh, uh, it's the uh, uh, drug-resistant epilepsy definition by the International League Against Epilepsy. If we have failed two appropriate medications, then uh, we need to consider uh, different options. And it's very important to mention appropriate drugs because if we're using narrow spectrum drugs to treat primary generalized epilepsy, that's not gonna work. Next one, please. Now I, um, I will move to devices in the treatment of epilepsy. And uh, that's a promising era for epilepsy patients, for providers in the field of epilepsy, for everyone involved. 
1996, many, many years ago, VNS was approved. That was a turning point, the first device that was approved, although there was research coming from the 70s about potential use in epilepsy. In 2010, we have um, a trial that concluded the seizure frequency increased individuals re receiving simulation. Now, in 2012, we move into the responsive neurostimulator. So we have something that is implanted in uh, the brain and uh, we can stimulate the seizure focus directly. And in 2017, uh, DBS system was developed and uh, by stimulating the thalamus, a midline structure, we can better control seizures. So you can really see the, the, the development of devices starting 1996 to 2017. This is very important progress that we have seen. I have seen in my lifetime as an epileptologist. And I'm looking forward to more devices or improvement in the device in delivering therapy in the devices that uh, have been approved. Next one, please. And this is the Agus Nerve Stimulator. I typically, when I advise uh, patients and families, I say it's like a pacemaker. Uh, it, it is a reversible technique if we think it's not working and doesn't have uh, it does not have significant uh, side effects. I have seen improvement in, um, uh, in, you, in managing it as a, as a provider. Uh, the device itself has become smaller. We have a tablet that we use, tablet that, that stores a number of data about the device specifications. And uh, the, the most significant improvement is that based on the knowledge that heart rate increases before a seizure, we have come up with uh, identification or detection of heart, increased heart rate. And we set the threshold and if we see that heart rate increases, then we, uh, the, the, the stimulation um, increases or fires, the device fires. And we think that we can prevent seizures from evolving. The next one, please. Uh, so vagus nerve stimula stimulation, how it works, it delivers around the clock stimulation. So we think by doing so, we prevent, uh, we decrease seizure frequency. It, de it delivers extra stimulation when tachycardia is detected based on studies that we know that it be, might happen in many individuals prior to a seizure. And of course, a, a very, very, uh, important feature of this stimulation is that when we have auras and we feel that the seizure is coming or if the family members realize that the seizure is about to happen they can uh, really deliver on-demand stimulation. The next one please. Uh, eight out of 10 people with epilepsy may have an increase in the heart rate that's why they develop the new VNS models. And uh, how uh, many, everybody, I would say, is asking me when I offer these treatment options, how does it work? And the truth is that we don't know how it works. This doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but we don't know exactly how it works. It might be release of uh, neurotransmitters that uh, disinhibit uh, excitation of the brain. It might be changes in blood flow, or it might be through some brainstem uh, nuclei that it stimulates and through this we uh, uh, prohibit uh, uh, the spreading of excitation in the brain. Uh, next one please. And uh, this is um, uh, what happens uh, before a seizure. Uh, the heart rate uh, increases as you can uh, uh, see and therefore it fires more. So it's a kind of on demand uh, based on a parameter stimulation. So parameter is the EKG that in, increases the tachycardia and then it fires and we think that it blocks uh, the seizure. Next one, please. And again, um, we, uh, these are, uh, some uh, statistics that we use. I typically tell uh, individuals that 50% uh, 
of people who had VNS realized 50% seizure uh, reduction. And I have to say that we can, we should wait more than one year to see some benefit. Uh, but this is not a bad thing because uh, it seems that we somehow, it takes time to deactivate the uh, networks that uh, create epileptogenesis in the brain. So it may take up to one year to see a, a, a benefit. Next one, please. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we spoke about uh, the efficacy and the common side effects are minor, I would say. People may have a cough and typically when it fires, or when you set up the parameters, but, uh, and also the, they have uh, a voice, like they have a call for very few seconds when it fires, but these are not significant side effects. So people really tolerate it very well. Next one. Responsive neurostimulator. And again, it is a turning point. We are moving from continuous neurostimulation to neurostimulation when we see seizures happen. It was very, very important because having the, in, in the device that is implanted and uh, provides two leads to stimulate the epileptogenic focus. It's very, we got a lot of information. We can uh, see that there are seizures that clinically are not present, people are not aware, but we can monitor and see that there are seizures that are going on. And this is very important information. So this device is not only a therapeutic device, but it's a diagnostic device. I want you to think about RNS, SMEG that is running at all times. People also after a seizure can uh, upload data through a wand so we can further learn about the ictal patterns. So next one, please. Uh, this is uh, how it's implanted under the bone. It's not, uh, uh, it's well tolerated. We do not have inf high infection rate or uh, malfunctioning of the device. Overall, it is uh, a well-tolerated uh, uh, procedure and uh, the provider can program it uh, from outside through a computer and uh, we can analyze the patterns, we can change the settings, we can tell the device when it's going to fire, under which circumstances. Next one, please. We have seen significant median seizure reduction in many, many individuals. And this is persistent and sustained over time. So we have run studies, long-term efficacy studies that showed that the response is sustained over time. 30% achieved more than 90% seizure reduction. And that means seizures of any type the auras or simple partial seizures or focal aware seizures, the new terminology, complex partial seizures or focal impaired awareness seizures and tonic-clonic seizures. Next one, please. Uh, the question that comes up is how long does it last? Because in order to keep going with this uh, neurostimulation, we need to uh, have a good battery life. We cannot go to the OR every two years to replace the battery. And they have improved the battery life significantly. Of course, that depends on the settings, but it has increased significantly. And I really believe that before I retire, I see more improvement in battery life. Uh, next one, please. And now we are moving to deep brain stimulation, another important turning point. I'm so happy to see that you're moving from one device to the other because I'm pretty certain there might be more devices coming uh, uh, down the pipeline. And this is stimulation of the thalamus. We got the idea from Parkinson patients uh, who uh, responded to deep brain stimulation for different symptoms, obviously. And we uh, used uh, this experience 
at, uh, in epilepsy patients and it works in individuals who cannot, who did not respond to medication. Uh, VNS was not as effective. We do not have a seizure focus. Therefore, by stimulating thalamus, we hope that we can control seizures better. Next one, please. Uh, so we have the deep brain stimulation that it is a thalamic stimulation and uh, responsive neurostimulation uh, uh, side to side. Next one, please. Uh, so again, as we have seen with DBS and also uh, VNS, devices work over prolonged periods of time. So we uh, see that even if initially we don't have good response, over time the response is sustained or even increased over time. And uh, after seven years with DBS, 84% of patients were satisfied or satisfied with the results. And that uh, this is not like the scientific data that we give uh, to in the, uh, based on studies, like we have 50% reduction in 50% of, uh, of patients, but we also want to see how patients respond to the stimulation, to a device. So this is a new way of looking at the efficacy of devices, how patients are satisfied. For instance, I had patients on some devices that they said, okay, my seizures didn't go away, but you know, I have less side effects, fewer side effects on medication, and I have the same or better seizure control, or the duration is shorter, or I have a warning. So it's very important to capture patient satisfaction when we use devices and medications, of course. Next one, please. And side effects, uh, of course, there might be some technical side effects that uh, the leads were not placed appropriately. We, we may see some site infection uh, where we, we cut uh, the skull uh, to insert the leads and some pain. Some paresthesias uh, have been reported. Uh, thalamus has to, do, uh, has to do with sensory uh, networks. Uh, so these are the most uh, significant uh, side effects. Next, please. It seems that it doesn't affect uh, mood uh, or memory, so it was not a reason to discontinue the study. Memory impairment was uh, found um, uh, and depression. However, these uh, side effects, if you wish, were not the reason to discontinue therapy. We found status epilepticus in 6%. Uh, uh, however, the SUDEP rate was lower than expected in refractory epilepsy. Next one, please. Next one, we have invasive, uh, not, uh, um, I would say uh, very um, uh, uh, non-invasive techniques uh, to uh, treat an epileptogenic focus. And this is MRI guided laser thermal therapy. So what happens is we find the seizure focus and this is, um, uh, we, I refer to temporal lobe epilepsies, although it has been used in other types of epilepsy. So we identify the seizure focus on imaging, and then we apply uh, uh, a heat that it's guided and it is in a very well controlled environment and we destroy the structure that creates the problem. In this case, the hippocampus. So this is uh, uh, a promising. Uh, I personally had uh, three successful cases in uh, Detroit, individuals who didn't want to have open surgery and remove the temporal lobe, individuals uh, who were older and had comorbidities and they didn't uh, want to go through surgery. And I have to say that uh, the results were very good. So I'm looking forward to minimally invasive techniques, like laser ablation, we call it. And um, I'm looking forward to, to having more techniques or improve our techniques 
So we have one more treatment option for our patients. Next one, please. Uh, again, I mentioned about this. I mentioned my personal uh, experience. Uh, uh, it is. Uh, 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 it doesn't have side effects, and and uh, individuals uh, are uh, accepting this uh, therapy uh, easier than tell them we are going to have open surgery and remove your hippocampus or temporal uh, lobe. And we found that almost. Um, 60% with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy were seizure-free two years after the procedure. Next, please. Now, um, I will, um, coming close to the end of my talk, and uh, I would like to bring uh, positive uh, notes um, uh, to the group. And the positive note is that the NIH has established the Epilepsy Therapy Screening Project. So they take epilepsy seriously, and they uh, have resources to um, screen different uh, substances that or devices that uh, are uh, under development, and they are trying to uh, uh, help researchers to identify which devices or drugs or other treatment approaches can move forward in order to better treat epilepsy. So it's very important that this initiative is under NIH. Next one. So what uh, I see as the future of neurostimulation, not only improvement of the existing devices, but can we develop devices that can really uh, predict seizures and treat accordingly? And uh, there are some uh, efforts that are, are, are underway, either in the US or around the world. And uh, we are trying to see how we can use artificial intelligence to identify uh, seizures uh, before they even happen and uh, th uh, through computers to uh, identify and treat. And there are many things that are happening through the NIH, the American Epilepsy Society, the Epilepsy Foundation at national level, uh, also international level when the International League Against Epilepsy and uh, uh, the, uh, the many groups from the US get together and they discuss about new ways of treating epilepsy. Uh, next, please. We have seen a growth and success of precision medicine in oncology. We haven't seen yet precision medicine in epilepsy, but I think this is gonna be the future. This is what the new generation of providers will work with. And uh, although we have genetics that help us identify some genes in epilepsy, we haven't really evolved so much because precision medicine requires some genetic profile. And we don't have a good genetic profile of of many adult onset epilepsies, and we don't have a genetic profile to tell us that these medications are better for this individual versus those. So there are two things that I'm looking forward to, genetic profile of a patient when it comes to medication efficacy and genetic profile to see what genes we, are, we can target. Therefore, we can have precision medicine, which in my opinion should be also called individual medicine or medicine based on individual needs. Oncology has gone very far, but I think that you will see growth in the next decade or so. Next one, please. As a matter of fact, that's the end of my talk. And again, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of uh, this uh, big family. And um, I am available um, if you have questions. I don't think that we're gonna take questions now. Erica, please guide me. There might be a session 
later on. But again, uh, thank you um, very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinaki. And um, I didn't see any questions come into the chat during the session, but if anyone has any questions now, I welcome you to put them in the chat if you'd like, or you can um, use the raise hand function and raise your hand if there's anything you'd like to ask. And the other thing that I'll know is if you know, you want to absorb the information and think about it and have a question comes up later, um, you can feel free to send that question to me and I can pass it along to Dr. Spinaki and respond to you with, with her answer. Um, and the other thing that I would say, you know, as we're about to go into um, a short break is that um, this afternoon session is gonna be a little bit deeper dive into refractory epilepsy and hard to control seizures. And we're gonna be, um, we're fortunate to have a, a couple patients participating in a panel who um, have actually tried some of the treatments that Dr. Spinaki just described. So um, someone can share their experience about VNS and RNS um, surgeries. Um, so that's gonna be a great opportunity um, you know, this afternoon to hear a, you know, a patient perspective on what that experience was like. Um, so definitely stick around for, for this afternoon's training as well. And I do see um, a hand up or maybe that's clapping. Um, Jean, if you have a question, I, um, I'm gonna give you the ability to unmute and you can feel free to unmute and ask. But I think maybe that was cheering. <laughs> I apologize, yes, that was just me cheering about the refractory <laughs> session later. Wonderful, thank you, Jean, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if there aren't any questions right now, that's, that's totally fine. Again, if a question comes up later, you can pass it on to me by email and I'll get an answer from, from Dr. Spinaki for anyone who has a question. Um, but thank you so much again, Dr. Spinaki, for sharing your experience and your expertise. Um, I know I learned quite a lot. So, um, you know, we're, we're just so appreciative to have you here with us today. Um, and with that, I guess it's time for our break. So everyone go take a stretch, um, get some coffee, use the restroom, and please be back for our next